Dr. Hearn, thank you so much for, for being here and for uh, sharing your expertise. Uh, and really, you know, so, so we've discussed here, you know, wonderful idea formation, how you get research funding, how you can partner with industry. But, but what sort of barriers to technology implementation have you seen? And, and what sort of things are you doing now to try to overcome those barriers? Thank you, Daniel, Daniel for inviting me. And I really am uh, um, very happy to see colleagues I've known for 40 years, actually. <laughs> uh, we go back way, uh, way farther to Bob in particular and, and, to, and to meet new folks as well. Um, uh, first, let me start with, uh, I am an e-health or now more digital health optimist. Uh, so, but I was asked to talk about some of the barriers and some of the challenges to implementation. And I think, you know, I, I do think that that's where there's points of failure uh, occur with technology. Oftentimes, uh, solutions are developed uh, without necessarily sufficient stakeholder input at every level. Um, so I've become a very, you know, much a believer in the concept of co-design, uh, where you really actually develop solutions with the stakeholders for the where the solutions are intended to be deployed or by folks who are going to use them. And that carries through the whole development process. So that that's really a key. And I'll give an example of a project where we, we've really done that and made that a major part of the work. Uh, but the other is actually in implementation, which is where there's a real need to understand sort of the workflows and how disruptive technology solutions typically are, because uh, oftentimes we layer on technology to existing workflows. So it doesn't necessarily replace workflow, it's intended to augment workflow, uh, but at times it can disrupt, interfere with uh, uh, retard activities that are essential for clinical care and for payment and reimbursement and so on. So I've, I've seen that happen over and over again, and it's really unfortunate. And we have many, many examples of that. Uh, frankly, we have fewer examples of where we have successful development, design development, deployment, implementation, and sustainable you know, uh, uptake of these solutions. And I, I think we need to go there and get there if we're going to be able to uh, really transform healthcare. And so fortunately in my career, I, I spent the first decade of my career doing uh, behavioral pain research with you know, uh, aside Bob Jameson and, and Bob Kearns. Uh, and then sort of took a tangent. I really, I was always interested in technology from very early on. Um, and I've had plenty of PDAs over my career doing research with them and so on. Uh, but it was, it was really that I was interested in, in sort of technology, not only, uh, you know, the, the techie side of it or the engineering aspects of technology, but also for, as a platform for uh, solutions uh, uh, and for, you know, really scalability. Um, and, you know, I often thought about, the, the pharmaceutical industry has this uh, process where there's a clear path to, you know, development, uh, deployment, and uptake and sustainability. That, that model is well proven. We really don't have something like that in the digital health space, at least yet, although we're moving there with digital therapeutics and others, where we're looking to see ways in which we can develop solutions that then have a, you know, a fairly clear path to deployment and sustainable use. Uh, either through reimbursement or improving quality and outcomes and a value-based model and that sort of thing. Um, so definitely co-design is critical uh, in involving stakeholders through every phase. And then also really doing the, the hard work of understanding workflow and understanding uh, processes of care and how the technology is either to augment, replace, uh, support. Uh, you have to really carefully evaluate uh, those aspects. Um, and so one project I've mentioned uh, that I'm involved in that got me to the Federal Communications Commission, I should mention briefly, people often ask, what does the FCC have to do with health? Well, they actually have a lot to do with health. They have a whole task force dedicated to health because fundamentally they believe that, that uh, health care or health uh, is a value, uh, is a um, use case for the role of broadband and broadband enables solutions. And I've been involved in a number of projects, actually uh, one that we hopefully will release soon on, on mapping uh, broadband uh, by county uh, uh, and opioid use disorder throughout the United States. Uh, and we think that's going to be a useful tool to researchers to identify where there are pockets of particularly high use of opioids and low broadband access or end adoption. Um, but the project that we did collectively with the Federal Communications Commission and the National Cancer Institute was called, is called LAUNCH, which stands for Linking and Amplifying User-Centered Networks Through Connected Health, great acronym, 
Uh, so it's a public pi private partnership that was really designed to develop broadband enabled solutions in a very rural area of the country with high rates of cancer morbidity and mortality, which is the Appalachian region of the United States. Over the last decade, there's been a reduction in cancer mortality, but not equally distributed throughout the US. And in fact, in Appalachia, particularly Appalachian, Kentucky, the rates of cancer mortality have gone up for lung cancer specifically and colorectal cancer. So it was really an area of focus for that purpose alone, but also we know uh, the Appalachian region is very geographically challenging, remote. It's difficult to get fiber into the ground there and get access to broadband. Uh, and it became very clear, if you don't have access, uh, you are disadvantaged uh, in the health context. And certainly in the case of cancer, the evidence is if you're more than 50 miles from a cancer center, you have poor health outcomes uh, than those that are closer to the cancer center. And part of that is related to, again, easy access to care or regular ongoing access to care. And so we worked with uh, the counties in Appalachia that were targeted based on our mapping program with the FCC that didn't have great broadband, didn't have uh, easy access to care at the Cancer Center in Lexington, Kentucky. And we developed solutions that enable broadband access through working with telecommunication companies to bring broadband to those communities. And if you're following some of the work of the FCC, they're really investing a lot in trying to bring broadband to all citizens of the United States. That is the mandate for our task force. Uh, and then we worked very carefully with those communities. And I'll mention we have a, a we have a whole series of reports of the work. So if you're interested, you can go to fcc.gov forward slash health forward slash cancer, and you can read all of our publications about launch and the work that we've done. Um, and we really worked on looking at distress monitoring and screening for patients who have a cancer diagnosis and who live in those remote areas, so that we can connect them to their care providers using uh, co-created broadband solutions uh, to support their care. And we believe it's a model that's scalable. Uh, so we have what's called the launch pad, which stands for profile uh, platform for agile development, which is the idea of taking the resources we've developed, they're all available on the webpage and website, that could then be applied to other conditions, uh, particularly in other rural parts of the country, uh, where you know, once broadband is deployed and it's adopted, then the opportunity to deliver technology-enabled solutions that are co-created, co-designed is much greater, much, much more likely. So I see that as the path forward to really making sure we um, engage all communities. And I would, one final note before I, I, I stop, is this whole pandemic has put a spotlight on the health inequities and disparities we have. And this digital divide issue is a very big concern. It should be for all of us. And we don't want to increase more. We don't want to increase disparities. We want to reduce disparities in, in, in health inequities. And to do that, we have to make sure the communities that don't have access do get access. And it's affordable and it's sustainable and the solutions are meaningful to them. Then I think we can be successful. So I'll, I'll pause there. Oh, th no, thank you. That, so both kind of addressing uh, the points that Bob Jamieson brought up about how do you solve problems that exist in clinic? You know, how do you design the whole technology to integrate? And I really like your perspective about, you know, making work easier, not more uh, complex, you know, not adding additional burden to clinical teams and the patients. And then also critically making sure that the patients that you're going to give this new technology to have access to simple data you know, that, that way their, their device can upload and download information, um, which I think is really important. And um, something that I, you know, I wouldn't have considered if we hadn't already had multiple conversations about it. So, so thank you for, for coming and sharing that. Um,